again and this time i'm going to speak on artificial intelligence and its religious implications few who heard that i'm talking on artificial intelligence asked me whether it's a scientific talk or not there is a funny story of two people who entered the heaven's door the first one a taxi driver the another a preacher they were waiting but the door only opened for the taxi driver and not for the preacher the preacher got intrigued and asked the angel standing at the door the reason for which the angel why he was not allowed for which the angel replied because when you preached people slept but when he drove people prayed uh, so that's why i hope i'm going to keep you all energetic and i'm not going to take you much into science uh, but Uh, to take a first initially few minutes i would like to take you what is this artificial intelligence and what is this so called artificial intelligence machines and then come to uh, the real implications of this intelligence in the in christendom so first let me talk about artificial intelligence people confuse robotics with artificial intelligence because semi autonomous robots are there where you manually or control using software or uh, with your keys or something you you have normally you, when you we used to when we were children we used to play with that but uh, when you can make a machine intelligent like you can program it so that it can exhibit intelligence then you call it as artificially intelligent machines or autonomous robots how do you make a machine intelligent uh, i have heard many people who call their children for their studies why can't you get first rank as the next door child uh, why are you so dumb headed they just think that if some possibility is there such parents would love to program the neurons inside the brain of your children but it's not possible with human children but it is possible with a machine how do you make a machine intelligent you can make a machine intelligent by programming it using a language called machine learning these algorithms feed computer data to artificially intelligent systems using statistical techniques making them to learn and getting progressively better at tasks for example uh, you may have a machine you make to react in human like ways like i learn i know to recognize a face i can speak i can do a lot of things i can bring my computer i can work on the computer so now if you can train a machine to do all these things and one more thing i wanted to tell you about intelligence is all of us are intelligent in a general way we can do a lot of things for example i can look i can speak i can work i can sleep but uh, machines cannot do in a wide variety whatever you program in the narrow way they can do it right but even for example for me sometimes i might be good in grasping technical data but i am very bad geographically my children used to get so scared and fight with me whenever i go to a new place because i often get lost so each one has some deficiency so we are not intelligent in everything so how when we can train a machine to become intelligent in a superhuman way that's when problem happens move because at that time when robotics and artificial intelligence combine we get this autonomous vehicles and movies like 2001 space odyssey the terminator the matrix portray the scenes of a band of humans running away from super intelligent machines making some to believe that some day a few killer robots strapped with machine guns are going to hunt us all down either wiping out the whole human race or enslaving all humanity this is depicted in many science fiction narratives few others predict a more optimistic future where humans and robots are working together and humans using artificial intelligence as a tool to enhance their life where robots can help us like servants like cooking planning driving our cars and so on but are these hollywood and bollywood stuffs 
or would this become a reality in our lifetime? Would, can they become like humans? What it is to look into the eyes of a machine and to know that it is looking back at you and to know that it has thoughts, intentions, plans and design. Is it only in science fictions or is it achievable? That is the big question. So let me start. The, in, the starting of artificial intelligence, we can trace back to 1950s when Alan Turing published the landmark paper, Can Machine Think? He devised the Turing test using humans as his benchmark. So from that, it started. But now we have three types of artificial intelligence. So it's very important. Just remember, we have three types. First is artificial narrow intelligence. I said that we are very good in something. For example, this machine can just type it or this machine can just speak. So it's a narrow intelligence. The second is artificial general intelligence. That is us like humans, it can behave. We are all having general intelligence. A machine can become like a human. Then the third category is artificial super intelligence where a mission is more capable than a human it surpasses human so what it is what so now we have only in this world whatever we are right now we are only seeing artificial narrow intelligence people are telling that in another 10 to 15 years we might achieve artificial general intelligence where um, missions can become like humans but in after some 100 years or 90 year, or 80 to 100 years, people believe that we can achieve artificial super intelligence when machines can overtake humans. So let me take first artificial narrow intelligence. So uh, one period of time, you know, I got into the cycle of buying and returning products through Amazon. Whenever I switch on computer, Amazon would bring beautiful saris addresses in front of me. So I just get tempted to click and I will order, but when I receive it, it will be very bad. And so I return it, I buy and return. But how Amazon came to know about my taste? This is through an artificial intelligent program. That program recommends you songs based on how you listen, what all songs you listen, it understands. This, these machine learning algorithms try to learn and recognize images based on the principles of our brain. When you feed hundreds to thousands of images, it distinguishes between a car, it distinguishes between a cycle, a therapy, like how you train a newborn baby. You just put objects on them, throw, and they try to catch, they fall, they get up, and the same manner we can train artificial intelligence to do that. So that's when artificial intelligence one. So these are the three types of artificial intelligence, artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, artificial super intelligence. So I said that we are right intelligence. So take this case of this brick uh, lady robot. So you can, you can just lay bricks, 3,000 bricks just a day, whereas a human laborer needs 300 even if you work all day. So this robot can, just in two days or three days, you can build a building. So this is installed in many places in the US. You can, this robot you see here, see this is trained to pick this ball and throw the ball and that robot is trained to catch that ball. So how you train a human child um, in catching and throwing the objects that same way, you can train these uh, um, uh, ro robots and artificial intelligent robots in such a way that it can learn to 
I learned by training them. This is the way you do it. So now this is at all, uh, this bricklaying robot can replace many people. So using this narrow artificial intelligence, we can do works very fast, efficiency is more, but what about empathy? That is the question. For example, now I, I use this one for uh, doing a variety of jobs, but if I can use it to help somebody, is it possible? So now I can train it to do many things, but I can never train it to get into an empathy. For example, um, and uh, one more problem with this artificially intelligent robots is it, has re it is the, having the capacity of making the rich rich and making the poor poor. Uh, in mid-2016, Apple and Samsung supplier Foxconn Technology Group uh, told BB BBC that they have replaced around 1 lakh 10,000 people because of robots. And if, earlier when I was in Palamkota in my street, people are used to tie threads on both sides and they used to weave. But now we can never see because it's replaced by machines. So now what about those jobs? How are we going to replace them? Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google, said in October 2016, the last 10 years have been building a world, world that is mobile first, but now it's going to be artificial intelligence first. He says that the combination of artificial intelligence with quantum computing is going to solve the world's problem. Quantum computing, you can do many problems at the same time. It's much faster than parallel computing or supercomputers. He, you know this earlier, the Voyager 1 had only 10 kilobytes of memory. Even the mission that was used to send people to the moon had much lesser capacity than what you have in your Apple phone. So this way that now we are going fast and fast up in the thing in computing, in technologies. And we have, there are a lot of advantages of artificial intelligence. First, let me talk about the advantages and then let me come and then finally end up with this implications. Now you have a watch, we can talk to, we can send message, you, it can check up our blood pressure and robots can build houses, they can deliver pizza, fold image, can even fold your clothes. They are using even in creative arena to write music, even to write uh, documentaries. For example, people once they showed to a machine learning algorithm, lot of trailers, how to make a trailer for a documentary. And you know, it made a beautiful documentary. So that is when you can do many things and it's a lot of advantages are there. I want to show you a program called NanoRobos, which helps in eliminating uh, cancer. You can eliminate cancer by using this robot. See, now I can, this is a NanoRobot. This nowadays you use chemotherapy. Chemotherapy destroys good cells too. But now this robot, you swallow it. It goes inside your bloodstream and your doctor from the outside can use a magnet and can move the robot inside. The robot can move inside. It can take a picture. See, it's sending a dye. It can take a picture of that area and it can correctly exactly wherever the tumor is that it can detect and it can deliver the drug. So this sort of things, uh, robots are very good. And, but there are some places where robots need not be good. For example, in this one, you will be, you are able to, you are using the technology to help you. And for another doctor, for example, he wants to know a lot of data about diabetes. So he's using a robot to study about all the papers about diabetes and he is able, the robot is able to get it and give it to him in a concise way. So there is no, his time is saved. So he's able to study the latest technology and he's able to help the patient. In that case, robot is very useful. But now take this case. You can just look at
now this robo has decided to kill that so now who is responsible for this now are we is it ethical to allow a machine to kill a man so that question comes into picture so when we come to disadvantages i wanted to take it in three ways the first one is uh, how are we able to make this training data is proper and the second one is eth ethical nature is it ethical to use such things the third one is how accurate they are so let me take one first see now this machines are i have to show you this uh, this military robots military robots are the worst thing for example there are no laws for them they can kill they are killer robots and uh, you have you can take a predator drone and which killed osama bin laden and you have to just train it and this sort of people if you see you just kill them so it will have only to be trained to kill uh, a black color person or a, a properly built person or whatever it is whatever is built in by killing so now you are not sure whether it is doing the right job or the wrong job so the first revolution in warfare was the invention of gunpowder the second was the nuclear weapons and the third is this lethal autonomous weapons it's going to be a weapon of mass destruction see now both countries are having this uh, machine guns loaded this robots loaded with machine guns now as some robot in something when it is walking it tripped and fell down and the gun it's it the gun has shot has gone hearing that sound the opposite side robot takes the gun and starts shooting and now both sides are shooting and people are there and who is at loss so this sort of things can happen that's why people are so scared so unlike humans they don't have empathy and one more thing is whatever we feed into them whatever we train them they do it now you have a artificial intelligent lawyer for example people use this uh, learning algorithms to help the judges to determine one is supposed to go to the prison or not now how would you train that algorithm how would you train for example now if you want to make a pancake you show to the machine some thousand ways of making pancakes and then it learns that and does it but it can be correct about 99.9% but that can be an error of 1% but that error can create a lot of problems for example you are training a wolf when you are training this is the wolf this is the wolf it should have a snout and all these things all the time maybe there is a snow at the background so the machine language algorithm thinks if there is a snow it's a wolf but if it can de determine a dog also as a wolf so that is the problem now based somewhere when they use this algorithm to find out who can go to prison they found that this bias of black color person will do more crimes built into that source code they were not able to understand but many people had gone to the prison based on that similarly amazon's uh, artificial intelligent hiring engine behaved discriminately against hiring women you know what it is based on the source code you are asking an engineer to program and he programs it based on the biases of him built inside so now whether this machines are correctly doing accurately doing and whether it is ethical to use it to do it so that is one question so now when you are striving for efficiency you are losing out empathy and accuracy is it right to use that so take the case of self driving car many people use this self driving car as but recently they have found last three uh, fatal accidents when they have got they found that it was not properly utilized because they have used the self driving facility but they have got into problems when they try to understand it was a long truck so when you design um, a train a program you will tell the truck will be this size but now if an 18 wheeler truck comes in front of you the algorithm fails to recognize and that's when you had a head on collision so who is responsible for this so this sort of is technology itself wrong i remember the story of babel so it is told in the book of genesis where a bunch of people were trying to build a city with the tower up to the sky 
but it is not about that building a tower it's a story about technology someone invented something new they invented bricks and mortar that allowed people to make things there was a powerful leader nimrod and who was essentially building an empire gets his hands on new technology and begins to use it finally he thinks he is going to be god and he is trying to make himself a god by making something bigger so that he can reach up to heaven so you can see here there is nothing wrong with the technology but it is in the wrong hands it begins to become a weapon when it goes into the wrong hands a tool to hurt people and that's when we are trying to make ourselves gods but here's the key point the flaw is not the technology the flaw is with the people who are using it who are abusing it now internet is the greatest technology we have it's an it has an on switch but it does not have an off switch it can never end so but people are abusing it in one of in our group one lady has lost 21 lakhs to a marriage scammer so this sort of things happens because of technology or because of the people who are abusing technology so now we have to be very careful to know that who we are and who we serve what it is to be a human so that should be the most important thing when we use such technology then coming to this chip people in sweden are having this high tech futuristic micro chips implanted into their skin that helps them to carry out everyday activities it has replaced credit cards it has replaced replaced cash around more than 4000 people have already having the high tech chips inside their wrist so here it's around the size of a grain of rice it's inserted into their hands among the fingers the pioneers are predicting millions will take up this like we have this glorified smart watches we have this chips also helps in monitoring the health it can replace you can just show your hand to a machine and you can get the money there is no need for uh, anything else to carry with you so that people say it might reduce the corona virus problem because you need not touch anything you can just show your hand so that's when the chip people are using now think if an apple watch could measure things like blood glucose how great it will be people think but it is not about the chip but integration with the other system and data sharing so that is the thing you are giving up privacy you are giving where is this data going who is having all the data about you when you are getting into a gym when you are buying something all the data are getting recorded and something who is having it and i think some people are happy to give up their privacy for convenience but many are worried this can increase because of scammers many in christendom what they think is many think this chip as the mark of the beast this has been a hot topic for century will it be a microchip in the wrist or will it be a vaccine or will it be a universal id card will it be the mark of the beast that comes in revelation 13 16 to 18 he causes all both small great rich poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or on their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name here is wisdom and finally you can read his number is 603 score and 6 so now to answer this question is the chip the mark of the beast or how long we need to wait till the mark of the beast comes honestly i do not know but i will say that though the events of playing out in the world that indicates it's might be coming sooner throughout history some people have claimed that they know exactly when the world is going to come to an end and they were clearly wrong the bible warns us against making precise predictions about the exact time of jesus return since jesus himself said 
no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. In Matthew 24, 36, you can read. One prophecy is very clear. That is, we can never dismiss. Dismiss as something wrong because Jesus warned that someday this world is going to an end. Not because of war, not because of natural disaster, but because God will intervene and bring it to an end. The future is in God's hands and he alone can bring an end to the world. So there is no need to fear for a chip or an art, this artificial intelligence. Though God has not promised us to deliver us from such tragedies in the end time, he has promised that he will walk with us, he will live with us, and he will work through us. And then he will take us to heaven. And that's so important. The good news is we need not fear that day because when we have our faith and hope in Jesus Christ, we should never fear for the end day. So that's why we should never give heed to this countless dangerous doomsday prediction that are going online. I just read often this dangerous doomsday predictions. When we study the book of Revelation, we are asked to concentrate on Christ. When John saw him, the one who was leaning on his breast, saw Jesus, glorified Jesus, he fell down flat at his face. That is the power of the coming king. So that is the power. That's what we have to keep in our mind. Because in invoking end time biblical prophecies may sometimes bolster some people's faith by giving meaning to events that seem cruelty and, uh, and others. They can also damage some others psychologically. For example, some people are into panic attack. When I was around three, five years old, when I was in LKG, my sisters were telling that the world is going to end today night. The whole day I did not sleep. I was sitting and crying, crying. I still remember that. So doomsday predictions from the Bible can also lead to something because it, people will think that anyhow it's going to get worse. So better we will not do anything about it because it's God's will. But God has asked us every day to work as though it's the last day of our life. There is only one life that belongs to God. That's why every day should be thought of as the last day of our life. And while we should never quench the spirit nor despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. Because the gift of prophecy is true, but, and I have been benefited, but it is not or bringing fear into people's mind. That's what I wanted to say at the first point. First, there are three things I want to bring today to the notice of all, to the thoughts of every one of you. The first one is we should never heed to the doomsday prediction and fear. So now coming to this artificial intelligence. Still this time, I have only talked to you about this narrow artificial intelligence. The next big advancement is likely to be the pursuit of artificial intelligence that can transfer human consciousness. People are trying to transfer human consciousness into a supercomputer. They are thinking that it's just going to take place in another 20 to 30 years. So that such a human intelligence will not only drive your car for you, it can make coffee for you, in the morning, all these things would uh, begin to be very, very next year. It can do everything for you. So you are going to live with a machine. So your program called, you know, your program called AlphaGo was written by a group called DeepMind. And this uh, program was given all the accumulated knowledge about this game called Go. This Go was done, this uh, uh, game called Go was started by a, legend that there's a story emperor uh, yao he started it in 2300 bc it is much complicated than chess so what these people did this deep mind people they uh, uh, put everything into this machine all the history how people have won how people have done everything about this uh, go google go has got it so when it was asked to fight against uh, beat against another human champion, it won. Google Go won because it was it won against the champion Lee Sedal. In 2011, 
IBM Watson won US quiz show Jeopardy. In 1996 and 1997, IBM Deep Blue defeated chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov. All these things, what is showing to us? That is that telling that machine will overrule human intelligence? In May 2020, Microsoft unveiled a new supercomputer. It's a fifth, he's telling he's one of the most powerful machine in the world. And he says that this machine can train other machines. You know, if you have made a machine which can itself train itself and can develop much better and can train other machine, then there is a danger. Because what it is going to train another machine, what I'm sure is to, this is going to become the super artificial super intelligence. So as a technologist in this field, I'm intrigued by the cleverness in designs and algorithms of various artificial intelligent disciplines advancing. But I wanted to say it can never outperform human because it extremely underestimates the intricacy of God's design and his creation of mankind. Secondly, such an agenda will incur so much uh, expensive opportunity so to the cause and so much of money will be involved and it, if it tries to supersede humans it will not be a realistic and what happened in Babel how God destroyed it that same thing will happen again that's what we should be very careful when we are making programs whether the programs are supportive right now even Stephen Hawking was so much worried about how this uh, machines that can program themselves and can program other machines are getting developed. Initially, uh, uh, next I would like to speak to you about the humanoids. You know, humanoids are people want something like a human face because when you have a human face, human uh, lady or a man next to you and it can do anything, you don't feel lonely and you get everything you get a role you have a role of a personal assistant you have a receptionist you have a friend desk officer and that's when but a lot of work has to go into this human i wanted to show you a small video clipping jimmy uh -huh. would you like to play a game of rock paper scissors robot style sure okay let's get this game going show me your hand to start Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I won. This is a good beginning of my plan to dominate the human race. So <laughs> 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 So, see, humanoids can be either androids or the android is a humanoid robot designed to resemble a male human while gynoids look like female humans. They work through certain features. They have sensors, they can sense the equipment, they have cameras, they have motors placed at various locations and that's when they can do exactly human functions. They are created for a variety of reasons like entertainment purposes and many other things. Some are even helping for elderly people. Now this Sophia, what I showed the first robot, the Sophia, that was done in the May, like uh, Adri Hebman, he, she's an a actress. It was made exactly in her image. It has a transparent skull and it was having a delicate motor control to emulate human emotions. You can see her, how she was winking. So rubberized phases driven by tiny motors and many things. You know, this robot was given, it rocketed to stardom. Even the, uh, the, at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it was comfort citizenship. An ironic move given the limited rights afforded to Saudi women and migrant workers. They are not given the rights, but to the Safaya, they gave the right of citizenship. And the next one, what you saw was Erika. She had a beautiful face and she's had a, a better speech and an ability to understand. So the designer looked at a lot of beautiful faces and exactly he made the wish nose should fit in, eyes should fit in. So now let me come to the implications. 
So you have you're trying to create a machine that can look at you, that can speak to you, that can emulate human emotions, then that can do everything for you. So and so that you can and so somebody was telling that one day humans and robots will be able to love each other. Is it true? Try to see if you can make a human a robot more human. You are trying to make it more human and it is sitting next to you all the time. It is looking at you when you are sleeping and getting up. Won't it be so intriguing? Won't it be so bad? Earlier I used to love Sri Devi's face so much. But when she started putting water, her face became so bad. The same way when you try to make a machine, like a human machine, like a human face, you don't, don't you feel that it's trying to just get uh, creepy? more creepy and now people are thinking artificial intelligence is a form of god i wanted to tell this is called as transhumanism transhuman it's something something beyond human earlier you had something called gnosticism that people we are having material body and a spirit is inside the material body and you need a higher wisdom so that the to make the spirit to go out so this artificial intelligence, people are thinking we are just brains and our minds are just like brains and we can emulate, a machine can emulate a human. A chip can emulate a human. This is such a crazy way of thinking. This is a concept of transhumanism. You can download anything to a human chip and you can think that this one day it can think like you, it can act like you, it can even you can replace your uh, lips, you can re because it can uh, smell it, you can replace your nose. And uh, so this sort of things people are trying to see something you can make a uh, human. But I wanted to say at this point that the superhuman, the super intelligent one, the one who made heaven and earth, the one who made two trillion galaxies and each galaxies with billions and billions of stars became human. And he said that I am giving you my spirit so that you will have my wisdom. But we have made ourselves so much intelligent in this worldly way that we have lost our wisdom. So that's when we get into the term called pride. You know, pride is the worst thing for a human being. The president of United States, Abraham Lincoln, in March 1863, he appointed a national fast day. And he said that day is something amazing. You can read it in the net. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth and power as no other nation has grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own intoxicated with unbroken success we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace too proud to pray to the god who made us yes the world has become too proud to pray to the god who made us no you this i love this uh, book the cross and the switchblade by david wilkerson they are all amazing people he has they were all known for their humility. And um, C.T. Studd, one of the English great cricketer, he left everything of his wealth and he became a missionary to India and China. And that's when such people, when we have one side and now we forget them, we get into this pride. This pride is such a worst thing. Satan fell from heaven because of pride. Renald Neighbor in his book, The Nature and Destiny of Man, says there are three kinds of pride. Pride of power, which seeks autonomy. Pride of knowledge, that things that know everything it knows. And pride of virtue, that most of the leaders, the spiritual leaders possess, that there is no need, they are too holy. 
And that is the pride. So now this artificial intelligence, if one of this pride is present, then there is a doom to the humanity. This pride of wisdom, this pride of knowledge, it's not wisdom, it's knowledge. So we have relieved sometimes, we try to think that we are relieving God from his responsibility. And we try to think that we are omnipotent, we know everything and we are nothing. One minute this coronavirus has shown that our life can be taken away. And but still God looks at us and says in Psalm 8 that... What is man that psalmist was so intrigued when he looked at the heavens, the works that the Lord has made, the stars and the moon. He says, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man, that you're thinking of him? He, because we, God has given us such a great position. We have been made an image of God, both male and female in the image of God. That's why the super intelligence became human intelligence. He came down to this dusty planet and took up the cross to redeem you and me. So much he loved to give us wisdom. We look at knowledge. Paul says, I count everything as loss. I count everything as dung to the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. That is the wisdom. That is not knowledge. That is the wisdom that we have. You know, we look at the sea, that's a beautiful sea, we say. But does it have any image of God? We look at the sun. Can sun speak to us? No, we look at the mission. The mission, when we program, it can speak to us. But does, does it have an empathy? Can we leave our human child with a mission to take care of it? We admire beauty of nature. Can a mission admire? We have creativity. We question, why am I in this world? Can a machine question? We bear God's image, the image drive, where, which explains you, we have real value, irrespective of gender or intelligence or earning potential. Whatever we have, we have inherent value. Human life has dignity. That's why we treat others with dignity. Our life is sacred. Our neighbor's life is sacred. Genesis 1 is a foundation of everything. So that's why we need to be very careful. I want to finish by telling one story that I love it so much, that story of Daniel. So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in that dream, he saw a statue and a rock that came from nowhere that smashed the statue. He woke up and he said, I need to know what this dream is all about. So he called all the sorcerers, all the magicians, and all the people who, who he thought they are intelligent and asked them uh, to tell about this dream. He was so intelligent. So he asked, first tell me the dream and then tell me the interpretation. So the people could not do that. The sorcerers could not do that. The magicians could not do that. So he said, now I'm going to kill all of you. So this reached Daniel. So when Daniel came to know about this, he went down on his knees before God. You know, he said, I don't know what this dream is about God, but if you can reveal it to me, I will go and tell it to the king and I will preserve all these people. And that's when God revealed the dream to him. That was wisdom. Daniel went to Nebuchadnezzar and told everything what God told him. The greatest, the amazing thing is that with all his learning, he had the greatest knowledge of his time. But with all his learning, he knew exactly how limited his knowledge was. And he has to lean upon God's wisdom and not on his own philosophy or his education. So that's very, very important. Whenever our pride rises up, then there is a great fall. Many leaders fall down because of pride. When a leader falls down, you know, when a big oak falls, the lot of small, small plants under the oak also falls down. That's why we need to be very careful when we are Christian leaders, we need to be very careful how we are going to lead. And then finally, coming to the last singularity, there is a term called singularity, technological singularity, when people think that missions will overtake human beings. And at that point, we will be vulnerable, missions will become uh, will imprison us and or kill us. But I believe that is not going to take because that 
we know the story of Babel again. And so, um, and we need to be very careful when we are framing laws for artificial intelligence, how we can use it for human benefits and not against us. So I wanted to drive three things. That's a finally, I'll finish it with the three points. The first I said is that human intelligence is the greatest intelligence and no machines can come equal into it because it's made by God. And we have been given that intelligence to subdue and to rule over his creations. And the second, pride comes before fall. So unless we depend upon God, unless we depend on him, we are not going to rise up. And the third, let us not fear for the doomsday prophecies and have our eyes on Jesus and Jesus alone. He's the author and finisher of our faith and he is enough to take us through this difficult period of our life. When we have our eyes fixed upon him, he will help us to sail through this difficult pandemic in a very beautiful way. Let's close our eyes and pray. Precious Heavenly Father, thank you, Daddy, that you are with us. You spoke to us. And Lord, today, whomever have come here, if they are in fear, remove it. Lord, let your power of love and knowledge and wisdom come upon them, Lord. You are a God of compassion. You are a God who loves deeply. And Lord, let us understand your wisdom. Let us never fear this technology. Let us never fear for anything. Perfect love casts out fear. And today, let this perfect love come upon everyone who are listening, Father. And Lord, compelled by our love, let us take your gospel forward. And not by fear, but by love. Thank you once again. Lord, today you have blessed everybody who has listened and we give this time in your hands. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.